So yeah, we're here with Duncan, and we're going to now start diving into space law. So yeah, so what are the sort of things we're going to start covering in this section of the course? Okay, so uh, I think it's important if, you, if we're going to talk about space law to understand a little bit of the difference between national law and international law. Okay. Because, uh, you know, a, a large component of space law comes from international law yep. and then it's implemented in national law. Uh, then I'll cover the basic principles of space law. Uh, and some complexities in the application of space law, so something that might be really interesting for, for everyone, how space law applies to space traffic management and also to space resource utilisation. And, and these are going to be concepts we're going to explore later in the course, and I think it's good to cover them early because when we start diving into the mess that space man traffic management and debris already is, the implications from yeah the legal and then therefore policy side are actually quite interesting i think in how this all comes to play right right and and we we'll, i'll talk a little bit about the the policy side as well because you can't make law without understanding the policy behind it so it's important to talk about that it is i think you're right because you know you know people i think immediately question well, all right, you have these laws how is it implemented who enforces it all these really big questions and that is folded into, especially to come quite a few of these, you know, detailed examples that you're going to go get into. Right, right, exactly. So into uh, national law versus international law. And uh, first of all, the sources of national law versus international law. So on the one hand, in respect of national law, you have legislation, yep. um, acts of parliament, uh, and you have subordinate legislation, often called things like regulations or rules. Okay, okay, yep. Uh, and and uh, in Australia, for example, we have the Space Launches and Returns Act and subordinate to the Space Launches and Returns Act are a, a suite of rules, if you like. And so does, does this govern then what Australian companies can do in Australia, I presume? That's right. So they have to get uh, a variety of different licenses and permits depending on what they want to do. So a launch facility license or a launch vehicle license or a uh, permit for, for a, an Australian payload yep. uh, that, that is going to be launched overseas. And so this is kind of then, that, as you said, the national implication yes. of that law. So an Australian government body decides, evaluates, and awards these things. That's right. Okay. right. The, the, in Australia, the Australian Space Agency, but it's, it's not necessarily the space agency in every country. So NASA, okay. for example, is not the regulator. Yes. In, in the US, the regulator is the Federal Communications Commission on the one hand, and also the Federal Aviation Administration. And I think that's a surprise to people. They think NASA regulates these things, but no. they're, they're a customer and they have to get permission from the FAA and FCC as well, right? Right, right, exactly. So, so it changes by, by national jurisdiction. Okay. Um, the, the other source of law nationally is, is the common law. It's, it's the cases that are decided in courts. Okay. Um, so, uh, and sometimes um, the new principles in law come about by judges finding finding the law discovering what the law is now judges would say they don't make the law <laughs> they just discover what the law already was okay um you know but but you might be cynical about that and think well really they're making the yeah law. that's right i like the term discovery here because it does seem to be we've discovered the answer but the answer is coming from me right right exactly okay so then in international law, you don't have the equivalent of legislation. You have treaties, yep. which because there is no international parliament. Yep. The United Nations is not a parliament. It can't make law for all states. Okay. Treaties are essentially agreements between states. Yep. And uh, so it, they only bind those who are parties to a particular treaty. Yep. So I'll talk a little bit later about the Outer Space Treaty. Yep. Uh, and there are, I think, uh, I've got the numbers later, but 118 states parties to the the Outer Space Treaty. So 118 countries, but so that's clearly not all countries. Not all countries, no. Okay. But then you get to the second question, which is customary international law. And this is a bit like common law, but customary international law binds all states regardless of whether they've signed up to a treaty okay. or not. Okay. And so you might have a principle uh, like registration of space objects yep. 
in the Outer Space Treaty. And the question is, is whether it's become customary international law anyway. Uh, okay. So if okay. it's become right. customary international law, it doesn't matter whether you're a party or not. You, you still, still have to do you, it. You still have to do it. So um, in order to have customary international law, you have to have widespread and, and uh, nearly universal state practice. So states do it consistently over okay. a period of time. Yep. Um, and you have to have this, this mythical thing, a Latin term, opinio juris, <laughs> which, which is um, states believe that it is binding on them and they make statements to that effect, that, okay. that we believe this is binding on us. So, so, so it's kind of like both. enough people practice and buy into it, then it becomes a thing. Is that right. like the idea? Right, right. Uh, exactly. Okay. So, so it's important um, in respect of international space law or any, any sort of uh, international law to have an idea of what has become yep. customary okay. international law. Yeah, okay. So it's not just if and what it's been said here, it's what all the countries practice as well. Right. Therefore, then what rules you have to uphold. Yes, okay. yes, yes, exactly. And then you have uh, something else, general principles of law recognized by nations. So these might not be things that are written down anywhere, mm -hmm. but all nations have a concept of, um, uh, for example, if you're talking about the law of negligence and who, who's at fault in a certain situation, okay. and you're trying to establish, for example, whose satellite is responsible when two of them hit one another. Which is a real scenario. Right, right, exactly. And and uh, there's a concept of novus actus interveniens, which okay. is, is a new intervening act. Yep. So a new intervening act uh, breaks the chain of causation. Okay. Um, so the, the idea of a new intervening act is something that's known in all national laws and so therefore it's incorporated into international law as well to, to fill a gap in international law if you like interesting okay all right so it's kind of yeah again things that happen that fill things that weren't freely defined or already defined but now kind of are because they've happened right okay right right um, and then you have this final one, which is a, a subsidiary source. It's not truly a source. It's um, judicial decisions and the teachings of the most highly qualified legal experts. So people who write textbooks, for example, uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, and, and they say, we think so-and-so is a rule of international law. Um, and, and they might refer to customary international law. They might refer to general principles of law recognized by nations. It's not really a source in itself, but uh, bodies like the International Court of Justice will rely on um, these highly qualified legal experts to, to, de to determine what international law is. Great.